Welcome to the October 4th, uh, 2018 business meeting. I'd ask the County Administrator to please take the roll. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. We have Mr. Scott Seco here today representing the County Council's office and Mary Rathke serving as your clerk to the board this morning. I'll start the roll with Commissioner Humberston. Here. Commissioner Fisher. Here. Commissioner Schrader. Here. Commissioner Savas. Here. Chair Bernard. Here. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, Don, we have a presentation. We do, and I'm going to invite uh, our Assistant Director of Health, Housing, and Human Services, Jill Smith, up to the dais. This is a, a presentation regarding hunger in our community and announcing the results of the 2018 Health, Housing, and Human Services food drive. And uh, Jill, I see you have a guest to introduce as well. So it's, it's okay. Yes. I do. Ha Thank you very much. I am Jill Smith, Deputy Director of Health, Housing, and Human Services, and I'd like to introduce Kyle Hummel. Kyle works for the Oregon Food Bank as the Corporate and Community Relations Coordinator. And I've invited, we invited Kyle here today to help express um, the excitement and the thanks for your support and your participation in the H3S food drive that happened this year again. Very successful, and this year was a little bit different because we involved, we involved the county on a whole at a much greater rate. And I just wanted to share that this year we were able to raise 268,000 pounds of food. Now that's what we've raised overall. This year we raised $10,380 which resulted in 31,140 individual meals, which is pretty amazing. And those are for folks in Clackamas County. And as um, Kyle and I have been visiting, he made me aware of some things about the need in Clackamas County that I wanted him to take a minute and share, as well as some of the collaboration and the amazing results that have um, happened because of this relationship and partnership. Thank you very much. I appreciate the time. That's the biggest thing I want to express today is a thank you to the county, um, to everybody for being involved in this drive. Um, it is extremely important for us to have this relationship and have this drive in our county for more than just the resources that come out of it. The initial ripple that we all get hit with, with that um, 30,000 people we get to feed, which is amazing. And <clears throat> excuse me, the big reason to do the drive, obviously. But um, really want to thank you all for, for the opportunity to work with you as well as have the impact in the community and the county like we get to have here in Clackamas, which is actually very unique. Um, so the impact from this drive, just for a little perspective, our average food drive at the Oregon Food Bank raises about 200 pounds of food and a maybe two to three hundred dollars. You can let that sink in for a moment when you think about $10,000 raised um, and be transparent in the fact when you talk about operating budgets in the millions like this county deals with or the food bank deals with, $10,000 can seem not like a lot, but it is insanely important and really does add up, especially in that perspective of the average drive being about 200 or so. And then the really big thing about this drive, which is very unique, and I want to give credit to this county for being flexible in, is expanding the drive into funds as well. Um, you, if you look at the the information that's been provided, you might notice that there was a shift uh, a few years ago moving away from pounds, even though the drive was in our top five most successful pound drives in the entire state in an entire year. Uh, we moved away from pounds and went into funds because we can have a much bigger impact with that. So I want to highlight that and also thank the county for the flexibility of moving into that. Um, and then highlight specifically with this drive as well, the amount of work that goes in by the county to support their neighbors uh, through this, from the raffles and the collection and um, the work that goes in to get the food trucks here to raise money to then provide it to the food bank, it really does have a huge impact and adds up. So pats on the back to the dozens of people, probably hundreds of people that are involved in all of that. Um, and then also just to kind of highlight a little bit more of the uniqueness here in Clackamas County of this drive. Uh, I, I was, we were speaking on the way up and um, 
we don't have the same relationship with other counties in this in this community. Uh, my service area is Washington County, Multnomah, and Clackamas, and we have by far our best. I uh, hope the other two counties aren't listening. But by far our best relationship with Clackamas County as a whole. Um, most of my work in the other counties is divided up more by cities, and so the uniqueness of this drive to have an impact across so many different county offices, and then all the the involvement from those county offices, the trickle down is amazing. And this is what makes drives and the community impact so successful is when you have it kind of coming from the top, from a, uh, a board level down, and then from the people that are doing it. So I uh, just wanted to highlight that there. And then um, the uniqueness and other things that have come out of this drive and this relationship are ripple effects that are actually being felt nationally, to be honest with you. Um, we've been able to develop deeper relationships because of this drive with the county and through our Screen and Intervene program. That's a brand new program that started about mm, two or three year old, brand new now. Uh, but it's new to us and new nationally where we're able to get into health professionals' offices and have the health professional identify lack of nutrition that could be remedied by getting to pantries in their local area and then linking the patients with that. And that's all been done, started here in Clackamas County with our, uh, our staff person working with Clackamas County, Lynn Knox, and then being able to grow it. And then when the VA picked up on it, we've been trying to get in the VA for the last two, three years, Randomly this year, they saw the program. It made sense to screen all veterans through this program, and so then it has now been picked up and is being done at all VAs across the country. So just another way that the, this drive has impacts and ripples out into our community. Um, and then kind of uh, lastly, I just wanted to really let you know that we are here to support you, and um, we, will, we are here to, to put our weight and put our efforts and our staff time, um, my time and my dedication, as well as many other staff people at the food banks into this county um, and doing what needs to be done. I should probably be a little careful talking about this, but um, we are uh, very aware of the uniqueness of the challenges that face Clackamas County specifically as far as hunger goes and food insecurity, especially when you talk about youth and children in Clackamas County who are really hard hit with it. Uh, so we, we have actually looked at Clackamas County and identified it as possibly a place where we need to be doing a deeper investment into our, into our community and looking at partnering at a deeper level with the county to really uh, alleviate the unique uh, problems that are going on here. So uh, thank you for the time. Thank you for allowing me to be here and really to impress upon anybody in the audience as well, as well as the board, um, anybody that's listening to um, Oregon Food Bank is here to work with you to be creative and to find solutions. So if you are interested in hunger relief and working with your community, we are here to support you and put our weight behind you to make you a, a champion in your community and to lift up your neighbors in need. So thank you for the past involvement, for the future involvement and for serving our county like you guys do. I really do appreciate it. And I just want to wrap up by thanking the Oregon Food Bank and Kyle for his enthusiasm and his presence here today. And I also want to um, thank Rich Swift, our Director of Health, Housing, Human Services, who has spearheaded this effort. And staff um, tend to drag their feet because it's a lot of work, but every year at, at the end we have a lot of fun, we build relationships, and we're very proud of this work. And again, thanks for your support, and hopefully next year we can do even better. And we have a new thing happening um, in partnership where um, the Beaver Creek Clinic is now a food, food bank drop-off location. Every, the two, one Tuesday of every month, I think it's the first Tuesday, the first one was held just two days ago. There were over 76 families that came and, and um, received food during that first visit. So we're super excited about that. If well, you ever like, it's a wonderful volunteer opportunity. I, I was actually scheduled to do one this morning that I, uh, I backed out of to be here. Um, luckily, <laughs> I get to be here instead. But they're really fun volunteer opportunities. Uh, if you ever want to be, be there doing one, let me know. Yeah, you know, next week we're meeting with the school district leadership. And, and uh, I think Clackamas County Schools, I don't know about other schools, but we've stepped up in the summer to make sure that kids you know, have a place to go eat. I, uh, I think that one of the problems in Clackamas County is that we look like the richest, well, we are the richest county in the state. But then when you take away those communities that all that wealth comes from, we also have some of the poorest communities in the state. And, uh, you know, it's a big challenge. When I used to run a nonprofit, uh, especially during the economic downturn, we spent all our money on backpack programs and, and stuff like that to get in the school or clothing or anything. I think it should almost be a constitutional right to be able to eat. And, uh, and it's a shame that in this country we still have all these kids who go home hungry. Mm -hmm. um, 
So I appreciate your efforts. And Ken, you had something? Uh, just a quick question. Um, given the health impacts of a poor diet, um, I'm curious as to whether or not you provide nutritional uh, instruction to the two people and, I mean, teach people how to eat. Uh, there's a tendency for people to go up and down the aisles of a, of a supermarket and pick out all the worst foods you can eat instead of sticking around that outside edge and mm -hmm. fresh meats, fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, and stay away from the other junk. Yep. Um, and I was wondering, do you, do you teach that to people? Great question. Um, yes, it is the very succinct answer. We actually have two different cooking classes that are centered around that. One is called Seed to Supper, and it's my favorite. That's why I'm leading off with it. It is actually where we teach people to grow a portion of their own diet. Let me be very transparent. We are not saying we will teach you how to grow all of the food you need to live. It's just a portion of your diet. If you have the time, space, and energy, and the interest, we will teach you how to grow some of your own food. The other class that we teach is uh, called Cooking Matters, and that's actually a national cur curriculum that we belong to that teaches that. That's done at all of our regional food banks around the state of Oregon as well. Um, and that class is exactly what you're talking about. It's a six-week commitment by a student to sign up for it. It is a free class that is offered to the community at no charge, and anybody can sign up for it. We don't demand pay stubs or anything like that. We just trust people. Um, and that class basically covers in the six weeks everything from reading a nutrition label and how to properly diagnose what is actually in a nutrition label and what might be left out and how to apply that to your diet, um, as well as how to read the ingredients properly for allergy concerns and things like that. And then also the actual shopping and implication of it and putting it into your diet. One of the best pieces of that class is they actually show up at a local grocer that will donate a gift card to us, usually for $10, because that is close to the SNAP benefits or food stamp benefits someone in the position would get. And they're charged in one of the, the six-week courses of going through the store and buying a meal that will feed four people on 10 bucks and will meet these health requirements. And these health requirements are set up by our nutrition education department. So we'll actually help them figure out how to shop the outside of the store. And if you do need to go in that center part, go for the bulk aisle. Keep, make your money go the furthest, things like that. Um, so that's definitely something we're trying to focus on and expand, um, as well as to go back to what Jim was saying with the schools. The one area we've really identified in the last five years, I've been at the food bank for seven years now, in the last five years I've seen a big shift, uh, we intentionally, away from backpack programs because of kind of that episodic, here's one off, good luck, hope you're okay, um, and more into school-based pantries. So when I started we had, I believe, eight school-based pantries, and I believe we're up to 33 or 35 now. And that's been an intentional effort on our part to push more um, into that so that someone in that situation, child or parent, knows I can count on the school. I know there's a pantry there. It's going to be open. I can go even in the summertime. It, there's a resource there instead of, oh, hopefully Johnny comes home with a backpack today. We're, there's a resource here in my neighborhood. Um, so that's something we've been pushing and trying to do because uh, the fact that we're serving 34% of the, of the clients we're serving our children is a big bugaboo. So it's kind of yes to both of those. And one follow-up, Ken, too, is we are, in the last three years, we've started to look at all of our food banking in more of a healthy lens. I call it food banking 2.0, for lack of a better term. And it's where we really are looking beyond the food box um, and trying to convert our, our, it's a holistic approach to food banking with the screen intervene, trying to convert our pantries to shopping style rather than a food box style, helping bring the dignity back to someone that's going to need those services. Um, there's a lot of areas that that builds into. So um, I know everybody's time here is, is in very de in high demand and very limited. Uh, should the opportunity ever arise, I would love to take you guys on a miniature tour of our 33rd facility and really show you everything we have going on. Um, because it, it, food banking today, I, I, in seven years, I have yet to blow someone out of the water. When you come by for a tour, I can usually, usually impress you pretty much because what we do, we go so far beyond the food box, and I'd love to have the opportunity to show you should it ever arise. That'd be great. Paul? Yeah, I've been... Uh chatting from time to time with uh, one of your uh, members of your organization at the table, uh, some of the regional tables for advocacy and transportation, uh, Annalise. Yes. And um, uh, could you just share your phone number for people that are watching this? It might be helpful. People want to volunteer or give or be part of. Um, maybe you could sh just sh share your phone number. I'd love to tour your facility, by the way. Yes, I'll definitely. take you up on that. You, you know what is sad is I do not have our phone number holstered, um, ready to go here. I have my direct office line if you'd like to reach out to me to do a funder food drive. Sure, John. Um, go ahead and restate your name and the phone number. Kyle Hummel with Oregon Food Bank, and that's actually a nice little caveat for you. Um, my email is khummel at oregonfoodbank.org, H-U-M-M-E-L, uh, and you can always reach me there. And I am using the quick Googler here to find our phone number because I should have it memorized. I can tell you the first few numbers. 503 uh, 282 0555. 
and all someone ever has to do on the other side, just to cover quickly, if you ever are food insecure, if you're out there listening and you need food services, please, please just call that number. Our receptionists are very well trained in answering the call and saying, what county are you in? What is your zip code? And they will uh, look up exactly what the resources are for you in your county. If you need a hot meal, if you need boxes, if you need support beyond a food box, um, that number is the best resource to call. So again, that's just 503 503- 282-0555, um, and then OregonFoodBank.org is uh, the you know cliche in today's world. Go on the website; it's all there as well. And that's where actually the food finder is, where you can find food resources right in your local community, right in Clackamas County, right there on the food finder. Great, thanks for everything you do. Oh, definitely. Thank you guys. I really appreciate your time and, and efforts in the community. I want to add one other, a couple of things. One thing is our extension service. Uh, has programs on canning and uh, nutrition programs just right over here. Taxpayers support that program. Also, farmers markets often uh, double what your SNAP benefit are, you know. So, uh, you know, we uh, distribute uh, dollar coin, uh, wooden nickels. Uh, I'm, most farmers markets do that as far as I know, and that's a great program. And, you know, and it's not that you can go buy yourself a slice of pizza, you know, buy a nutritional food uh, that on, on most farmers markets have available. So, again, thank you for your service. Definitely, and thank you guys. You're right on top of it with all those things. You guys are awesome. Oh, and I just want to let you know that we are we're, we're trying what we call a cooking with the commissioner show where we go to farmers markets and then we list the uh, produce that you can buy, like under $20, and how you fix it. And the first one, they're editing it now, and it was on how to make eggplant parmesan. And I'm hopeful that all the commissioners will come on the show and cook with us, because Paul's Greek. Jim, you'll figure out something. I don't know if you're a cook. Sonia, I know you cook and can. You know, but there, I no, do barbecue. No, no, barbecue. <laughs> actually, actually, that Somewhere would be a fun one, where we could set up a barbecue on the back there, too. But. So, Martha, do so you know where that will be played? Pardon me? Do, do you know where that will be played? Um, I don't know where our media people are. It's a local television. Will we'll 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 television. television. Thank you. And we can probably put it on YouTube. But the whole point is to eat healthy to be healthy. Um, and, again, trying to keep the cost down. And surprisingly, at farmer's markets, you can really get some... You know, it's 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 doable. It really is doable, you know. And so I'm trying to just think of really tasty meals that are fun to make and whatever, so. Well, if you need any help, reach out, and I'll, I'll connect you with our nutrition education Ooh. department who has a great recipe and cookbooks, and we've actually done some doc demos ourselves when we have some products like we egg should have you. We'll have you on the cooking. You know, happy to be, whatever and, I can do to help. And I just want to let Gary Schmidt know, don't have your head explode. I know that he was like, oh, this is an experiment, and I said, I know it'll work. It'll <laughs> work, okay? <laughs> it can be part of public health and eating healthy, and uh, I think the tagline was, eat well to be well. Yes. So, yeah. And well, the other thing, thing that I works for me. It'd be great to. Uh, so I ran Milwaukee Sunday Farmers Market for 20 years. One of the things that I always tried to get going was when the market's over, somebody come by and get the leftover stuff. Uh, that we had people who came all the way from Eastern Oregon, and you know they don't want to bring that stuff back. And but never could kind of get that organized. It'd be great if somebody did reach out, maybe to the uh, farmers market. Uh, there's a state agent, a state group, and figure out how we could do that. The problem is, of course, these people don't want to drive somewhere to get your stuff. You can, if you showed up at the end of a market, you get a lot of fresh produce and stuff that. And some of these people go to five markets a week. Well, and the benefit, we might be able to offer them a tax deduction then as well, because most of these are local small farmers, and that way they can also get some return on their on their product and their investment. Yeah. So there's multi, multi wins there. Yep. Give me some homework. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, next, we have citizen communication, and I had uh, one from Les Poole. Please join us. Good morning, Les Poole. Uh, I live in Gladstone. A reflection from the audience there. It, um, it's amazing how big the problem is. 
and I appreciate everybody that's, that's trying to address it. And I sat there and I listened and, and something occurred to me and that was it's, it's very sad that we have folks that can't read a label and it's very sad that we have people that even when they know better don't take care of themselves. Um, it's a reflection on our school system. It's a reflection on some other social ills, but uh, not to take anything away from what the food bank's doing because uh, it's great work, but it's, it's also somewhat sad that we even need them. So it's, it's a tough issue and uh, it's gonna get tougher. One of the reasons it's gonna get tougher is that I, I came today to, to share a message that uh, Commissioner Savas will appreciate probably more than anyone in the room. And it's a message he shared with me 10 years ago when I first met him. And here we are with Metro's new forecasts for the future. New Metro report forecasts less job creation despite more population. With a subtitle, Manufacturing Jobs Expected to, de to Decline as Total Jobs Grow. That is a recipe for disaster. Very slow, slow disaster. We gotta stay after that. We gotta change that headline. We gotta change that headline. I don't know what we gotta do to be more job friendly, more manufacturing friendly in this region, but I think that's where Clackamas County needs to be the leader. We got a lot of, of potential here the chair just shared with us that we're the richest, and we are, the richest in a lot of ways and the poorest in a lot of ways. So we're, we're really in a crossroads of where we're gonna spend. And I'm troubled by some of the influence that Metro has in the region and over the county. Now, I'll segue to tolling, of course, our favorite subject in the region who is in favor of the current plan to toll us on existing roads with very little focus or clarity about where the money will go? Who wants to change the law? Who wants to change the law so we can be told to drive on roads and not fix the roads, not improve the roads? Well, of course, Metro's all for it. Who else is for it? ODOT? Why are they for it? Is it a solution? No, it's going to put more people down at the food bank. It's going to suck money away from all of us. And I would hope that the county would take a position on it. And whatever, and I mean whatever political uh, pain or suffering or punishment we or you may receive from Metro or any other organizations, we'll live with. It's it's not right what's happening in the region. It's not right with, with so much of what Metro is doing. And they have the ability to punish you if you don't go along with them. And we've seen that before. We know why we're getting grant money now for transit. Two, three years ago, we didn't get any grant money at all from Metro because we weren't playing ball. So it's a very awkward situation that we're in, but I can assure you of one thing. I, as one of the chief petitioners on the measure so that we can vote on this tolling scheme, I will do everything I can to prevent that from happening. And that will be my contribution to keeping people from the food bank. And I mean that sincerely. I'm way over. I appreciate the time. And I really do welcome the county taking a very firm position on this tolling issue because they're gonna be driving through Milwaukee, Gladstone, Town Center, and every place else you can think of to get around paying for it. Thank I, you very much. I think we actually have taken a position that uh, if we're gonna to toll, we expect to increase capacity. Uh, otherwise, I already pay for the roads. Good. We good. don't pay enough for the roads, maybe, but uh, I already pay for the roads. And you're right. Yeah, it'd be great Tolling to see something. poor people because they can't change their hours of work right. does not make any sense to me. It, you're right that people will end up going to the food bank because they can't afford to drive to work. Um, 
and if they do, they'll go through all the side roads. So capacity is important. Paul. I just want to, <clears throat> you know less. You've heard us. You've seen the letter uh, we've submitted. We've taken a strong position on this, and um, uh, different than that of any of the counties. So I, I don't think it's a question. Um, I, I know you've got a copy of it. I know you've seen it. You know you've heard us say that we've taken a position. So let it be clear. Um, um, and matter of fact, well in advance of, well in advance of the measure uh, or, the, or the circulation or the idea of a petition, uh, we took a position. Um, and I and I was I took put a lot of effort in making sure to circulate that position um, and went to a, lots of meetings. So I'm not sure. I uh, maybe I'm misunderstanding what you're saying. But um, well, as much work as I put into right. that, as you've, public as I've been. You've been great, and the county's been good. So when I say take a position, I mean it publicly. Well, I'm not sure what you I, mean. I, what we, I mean by that, that is, is, is I, I, I'd like to see more outreach to the media. I really would. I'd like the citizens that don't know what's going on, of which there are thousands, to know more, uh, to, to have a better picture of what the county's position is. I've been at the meetings. I've seen how hard you fought. I'm not questioning whether or not the county's taken a position, and I apologize if that's the way it came across. What I mean is we need more comment, more verbalization, more outreach in the newspaper so that the public understands that 80 or 90 percent of us and all of you are on the same page on this thing. And hopefully the public, which looks to you, will understand that you guys have researched it, and it's not just less pool, not to diminish myself, but our local government fully agrees with what I'm saying and agrees with the position that the vast majority of the residents have. So I do thank you for what you're doing and what you have done. Um, I just want to make sure the word gets out there that, that the county has a position on this and that it's very clear what that position is based on. So thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, we have something that was not on the agenda. And Don, did you want to introduce it or do you know? Oh. Oh, well, usually Don would say, well, next we're going to have. So Paul is going to uh, introduce uh, Veterans Village video. Yeah, um, just got wind of this just a little bit ago. So, um, so if we're a little bit awkward here, uh, everyone understands. So I guess uh, we'll play the video and then we'll speak to it afterwards. So fire away. Today we're introducing the public to the Clackamas County Veterans Village. The village is transitional housing for homeless vets to get them out of the weather, off the streets, into a safe, secure environment, and to be able to provide them uh, services and just help them move through into a more permanent housing situation. The work hasn't started yet. The work starts when these veterans move into these pods. We're gonna rely on the neighbors and the community and the county and organizations like ours and other nonprofits and for-profits in Clackamas County to make sure that every single one of these veterans are successful. The ceremonial opening of the door. The plan is by the end of the month, we have, uh, we have some people here, so our residents will be here and we'll be providing them the services and they'll be on a path to uh, permanent homes. They served our country and we want to help them get to a better place. This, this is just a drop in the bucket and we're going to keep working on this problem and we're going to keep working on it until we reach our goal of no veterans homeless in Clackamas County. Well, thank you. I, now PG, I want to thank PGA. 
I guess PGA put this video together and put this presentation together, so uh, Martha and I are going to have a few comments. Um, so again, thanks to PGA and all the staff that helped put this together. So as you probably saw, uh, I guess yesterday, a couple days ago, we start moving some folks into the, um, into the Veterans Village, uh, 13 men and two women. Um, and uh, we're, we're pleased that we can do this. Um, uh, we're pleased that we can actually help uh, our veterans move into a better place. And uh, it took a couple of years, two and a half years, to actually get this done. Um, it is the first permitted and code compliant, one of its kind in Oregon, and can serve as a statewide model. Um, and our goal is to get these veterans on a path to being self-sufficient and stably housed in quality housing. Um, this is a key step to achieve one of our performance uh, Clackamas strategic goals to shelter every homeless veteran by 2019. And, um, and again, there's a lot of ancillary things that go with this and that is really the path to permanent housing. Uh, Northwest Housing Alternatives is building a uh, breaking ground on a unit for veterans housing um, or or perhaps have a housing bond, which may have more resources, and we're adding to our, ir ir regardless or irrespective of the housing bond, we're adding to our, our, uh, our housing stock um, in our um, housing authority. Uh, so for all those who are interested in why and how we accomplish this goal, uh, please check out the videos uh, from the past couple of months on our Facebook page. Uh, we generated a series of Facebook Lives and videos that cover, one, the state of homelessness in Cal Clackamas County, um, how the Vets Village will operate, uh, the services the county provides uh, its veterans, the genesis of the project, the actual opening ceremony, and lastly, a 360-degree virtual reality look at the sleeping pods in the site. And I'll turn it over to Martha. Okay. Well, I just want to thank all the volunteers and the people and the folks in the community who stepped up in the plate to make this happen. We did a lot of internal work. And I'd also like to, uh, to really thank our staff that worked on this, because it was across the board from every domain that we have, every agency in our county was involved with this, uh, really trying to pull this forward because it was a, a really a big interdisciplinary effort. So we're going to continue to work that way in Clackamas County. Not only is it fun, um, it really informs good policy and helps us be better permissioners. And I want to thank my colleagues here, Ken and Sonia and Jim and Paul, because without their support, without uh, their, their commitment to this, it wouldn't have happened. And, and as, as I said, this is just the start. I know Commissioner Fisher is looking at new models, how to get people more quickly into permanent housing. You know, pod housing is transitional. We want to you know, uh, get people out from really unsafe living places and give them the there there. But the real goal, the ultimate goal, is to get them into uh, permanent housing, permanent things where really, uh, well, really, uh, it, it makes a huge difference. So this is just the first step. And um, we're, we're going to be looking at other frameworks. I know Commissioner Fisher can talk about that a little bit. She's working with some of our colleagues up north to make that happen. And so interest in the village has been extremely high, and we're happy about that. But what, we're gonna, what I'm going to say is we know everyone has good intentions and desires, but we're going to ask the public to leave the village in peace. If you want to visit, if you want to help out, um, we're going to ask that you uh, contact the site operator, go, go, Do Good Multnomah. They're a veteran-managed nonprofit specializing in providing services to homeless veterans because they have needs and folks need to kind of get have that quiet space have that there there start pulling lives together and that's what this provides it provides the first step for them to have security so they're not in survival mode on the street that's critical to gunning so so contact do good multnomah but let give folks the space and the time they need uh, to heal and Do Good Multnomah's uh, information is on our village web page, which is right off of the front page of our website. And we just saw the video, so it was beautiful. And um, we're doing good things for all of our homeless folks in Clackamas County with all of our multiple partners. But we all have that real love of veterans because of the service that they've given us. So thanks. Thank you. Okay. Well. Uh, Next up is a consent agenda, and we would like to add Sweet. something. Yeah, yeah. Sure. I uh, want to add something, and I'll ask uh, our d uh, county administrator to please explain. Sure. Uh, we uh, would like to add to the consent agenda item 
the consideration of approval of a contract with Pictometry International Corporation for professional services of oblique and orthogonal aerial imagery. And this is intended to support uh, the work of the Clackamas County Assessor's Office. The County Assessor, Tammy Little, is uh, here in the audience if you have questions about it. Commissioners will recall that during budget deliberations, we uh, uh, talked about and approved the funding for, uh, for this effort, which will significantly improve our uh, aerial imagery. Uh, to support the work of the assessor's office, but not just the assessor's office. This, this imagery will be of significant uh, assistance to our uh, dispatch uh, responsibilities, to our emergency management uh, functions, to uh, our uh, transportation and development responsibilities and our uh, business and community services department. So uh, DTD, BCS, as well as our techno technology services departments are also going to be uh, helping to pay for uh, this effort, uh, multi-year effort to get this implemented. I apologize it wasn't included in your agenda packet uh, originally for this, uh, for this agenda, but we are asking to add it onto the agenda so we can get the contract executed, so we can get the aerial imagery started before uh, the weather begins to turn, just so if we can get going on it as quickly as we can while the skies are still relatively clear. That's uh, why it's on there. All right. Thank you, Don. I uh, ask the clerk to read the consent agenda by title. Okay. Today's consent agenda. Under Health, Housing, and Human Services, approval of a professional technical personal services agreement with Conduent Health Communities Corporation for the Public Health Community Data Dashboard. Approval of an intergovernmental agreement with North Clackamas Parks and Recreation District for the cooperative use of the Concord Building in Milwaukee for the Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion Program. Approval of an intergovernmental agreement with the State of Oregon Department of Human Services Senior and Pe Seniors and People with Disabilities Division for the provision of non-medical transportation for Medicaid eligible case managed clients. Under the Department of Transportation and Development, approval of an intergovernmental agreement for right-of-way services for the Oregon Department of Transportation for the Canby Ferry Bank Stabilization and Intelligent Transportation System Project. Under County Council, approval of a settlement agreement in the case of Davis versus Roberts and all. Under Business and Community Services, a resolution for the approval of property disposition amended policies and procedures for the sale, transfer, and administration of tax foreclosed and surplus county property. Under elected officials, and this is the item added today, approval of a contract with Pictometry International Corp for the professional services of oblique and orthogonal aerial imaging. And under North Clackamas Parks and Recreation District, approval of an intergovernmental agreement with Clackamas County's Health, Housing, and Human Services Department to provide enforcement assistant diversion program space at Concord School property. That concludes today's consent agenda. Do any commissioners wish to remove or pull an item from the consent agenda? No, Mr. Chairman, I have a question on one item. Okay. <clears throat> item um, B, one, the approval of an intergovernmental agreement for right-of-way services with the Oregon Department of Transportation. I know it was reviewed by County Council. I was curious as to whether or not we've assumed any additional liability as a result of providing those services. Has, has that concept been looked at? And if it hasn't, can we do that? I, I don't want to pull this. I just would like to know. Sure, and, and Commissioner Humberson, I admittedly was not personally involved in approval of that contract, so I don't unfortunately have the answer for you off the top of my head. It is certainly something that I will uh, look into and we will get you an answer uh, shortly. Thank you very much. So I'd like to add that normally when you do right away, uh, uh, ex you know, you're acquiring right away or whatever, ODOT is the uh, people who do the negotiation. It's very common. Uh, when I was mayor, we must have did lots of those and they do that for us uh, it's just uh, I don't know why they do that why ODOT would do that but that's just one of the services they provide but we'll get you the answers you want well we're taking over the signaling aspect of it and that that was my curious what I was curious about mm. so whether that puts any additional liability on us or not mm. so all right um, so I entertain a motion 
I move to approve the consent agenda as presented and with the addition of uh, the item. Pictorial. Uh, yeah, let me get to it. Uh, with the item um, regarding uh, Pictometry International Corporation's imagery uh, services. Second. It's been moved and second that we approve the consent agenda as amended. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. The next item is county administrator updates. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I've just got a couple of items. I've uh, got a few um, very nice communications from local citizens regarding the work of our staff. Uh, so the first uh, involves uh, work that our Water Environment Services Department uh, is doing. We received a letter from a customer about uh, the work of uh, our permits technician, Allison Ills. Uh, the letter talks about how Allison went above and beyond when answering questions about uh, water and hookups and researching paperwork and arranging for the West crew to check out the property uh, and providing uh, detailed information uh, with property identifiers and cost projections and maps. The customer wrote, <clears throat> we've called West from time to time and uh, without exception, every interaction has been exceptional, polite, professional, courteous and helpful. Many thanks and kudos to Allison, the ground crew, and all the folks who work so hard uh, for our community. Most impressive. Uh, I just wanted to thank the customer for this note and thank Allison for her professionalism. Uh, we also received a uh, note regarding uh, one of our building inspectors, Travis Wright. Uh, it works within our Department of Transportation and Development. Uh, and noting how critical successful construction projects uh, require the w good work of our building inspectors. The uh, project superintendent for the Walsh Construction Company said, I wanted to let you know how much we appreciate Travis's help uh, on our project. He has been a true partner in helping us make sure we are giving the owner a safe quality building uh, that they will enjoy for many years. His knowledge of building codes has been critical and we hope to continue this relationship on future projects. So I wanted to thank Walsh Construction for sharing that with us and especially thank Travis for demonstrating excellent service. So, good. Great, thank you. I kind of want to add something to that. Um, you know, I, I have a project at my home and at least two or three times so far, I've heard that the county was not processing the, um, the uh, you know, the inspections. Well, so I checked. In every case, they hadn't even put in the application. So, I mean, if you get having a project done and you're hearing a story that the county's not doing a good job, take the time and check. Because uh, rather than waiting weeks for somebody to show up and then to find out that you the request was never made, it makes sense to, you know, get involved and find out that, that uh, the county is actually doing a great job. Uh, my project was actually held up for a couple of months, supposedly, because the county hadn't processed the application, and turns out they hadn't even put it in yet. So be sure and take the time and check. Ken. Yeah, on that note, um, I was just wondering, if you go in and if a contractor goes in and makes a request for an inspection, as an example, do they get a receipt from the uh, planning department that they actually made that request, which they could then show the homeowner that, yes, we went in and we actually did it's our job? It's online. Yeah. Uh, we do, it is we online? do keep a record of the inspection requests and the, when the inspections are conducted. So, so, yes. so the homeowner could actually just go online and determine that the, that the request was made. Yes. Yes. Excellent. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, next is Commissioner Communication, and uh, Ken, you're up. Thank you. Uh, we attended uh, the North uh, West, excuse me, the North Willamette Research and Event Center dinner uh, this last week. Attended the District 8 AOC uh, conference over in um, Hillsboro, uh, the Canby Chamber of Commerce luncheon. Uh, which was also a, a Q&A uh, with the board and, and the Chamber of Commerce. And uh, Martha and I attended the uh, Sustainable Forestry Tour with Mayor Gamba, Oregon Wild, and the Trout Mountain Forestry Group to take a look at uh, some of the techniques used in sustainable harvesting. Um, and on that note, I will then move to the dog. 
This is Toby. He's an eight-month-old Chihuahua mix, and he is the complete package. He needs someone who is willing to spend the time it takes to help him become a super dog. He needs consistency, patience, and training. A puppy training class would be good for him so he can become a successful and confident fella. Please go and visit him today. For more information about Toby and other adoptable dogs, please contact Clackamas County Dog Services at 503-655-8628 or www.clackamas.us forward slash dogs. Thank you, Martha. All righty, well, I've got, uh, try, and be, try and be quick, I've got a lot here. So I've been traveling around the state, uh, thanks to my colleagues uh, allowing me to do so as well, going to the district meetings for the Association of Oregon County, and as Ken said, we had our district meeting of District 8, which includes uh, the urban um, kind of interface, er, urban rural, we're urban and rural counties, but that interface up here with Clackamas, Washington, and Multnomah County. And I was really happy to see uh, our, our colleagues from Multnomah County um, really agree to step up, and including uh, Commissioner Fisher, who's going to be vice chair of the District 8 group, and I think it's going to be Jessica Vega Peterson who's gonna be the chair, to step up into these leadership positions as we work uh, as, as I would like to start an initiative um, with the association of really starting to think about and bridge those urban rural divides that, that we have, uh, we seem to have across the state. And in that vein, I wanted to comment a little bit about the sustainable forestry tour. It was really a remarkable tour. Um, it was very interesting as a biologist, uh, to talk to a professional forester and to walk through these areas and see how they're managing forests for diversity, uh, for uh, habitat. And I do think that those uh, methodologies are applicable um, across you know, the board, actually. But we're gonna have to figure out policies to incentivize and get that kind of out there to our other communities. And so, um, one of the things I asked Oregon Wild is to be patient because, you know, they, they would like us to leave, to leave another organization because there's a big disconnect with how they want to do forestry practices and the, the methodologies, these new methodologies that are being used. And what I've asked them to do is to remember that, um, you know, my role, our role, is to bring those two uh, economies together and then if we don't sit at the table, we can't actually influence the outcome. Their job is, is advocacy, which I admire and I respect and why I went out with them was to listen to their, their voice and about what they were thinking about this. And um, subsequently, I managed to, uh, the day before that we went on this tour and as I'm trying to think about all of this, how are we gonna manage this? How can we influence policy? How, how we can encourage uh, our rural economies in a really good way? Uh, I got a, a copy of a magazine called The Other Oregon, A Voice for Rural Oregon. And they have steering committee members and it's U Umatilla Electric Cooperative, Eastern Oregon University, which is designated as the rural university in, uh, in the state, Sky Lakes Medical Center, Life, Healing, and Peace, and the Energy Trust of Oregon. And um, I really, as you see, I read through the whole thing and really was kind of making all kinds of marks and yellowing things because I thought, wow, this is, it's like I was thinking about this and I thought, okay, I'm not the only one, I'm not alone. So I wanted to read this so, be, because one of the profiles really struck me and it was Heidi Kokar, who's a, who is the director of the Rural Development Initiative. And the question they asked her is, what is the one thing you want urban Oregon to understand about rural Oregon? And this was the answer, and this is what I've been thinking about, and I want to get this out to all my environmental friends. I wish that we knew our interconnectedness, and I wish we knew the complexity of rural. I think we simplify rural. We simplify something that's complex. The work I've done internally and the work we've done with diversity, equity, and inclusion has been eye-opening work. In some ways, rural is its own inequity. It has been oppressed, it has been marginalized, and it has been stereotyped. All those things that can be tied to race and gender, you can apply to this as well. It helped me to understand the complexity and unpack the problem. 
If Urban knew anything, it's that there is an interconnectedness. The investment is worth it and the opportunity to learn is great. A little investment makes a big difference. To, so to my environmental friends, please give me the space to work on that investment to understand the complexities of what it's like to live in rural Oregon, to understand the poverty issues, the drug issues, the domestic violence issues, the child abuse, abuse issues that they suffer as well in urban Oregon, and to know that we need to move past um, what's been happening politically in this country to really start to understand one another and to stop being adversarial as we move forward with policy. So one of my goals is really going to be studying forestry uh, processes um, and trying to influence in a positive way, not to be adversarial, how we manage those kinds of rural economies, and particularly forestry, the issues that we deal with with wildfires. So I'm not taking an adversarial view. I'm trying to really understand uh, and really bridge what I call the empathy wall. And of course, empathy, I think the best example is you kind of know and you understand what other people are feeling and what they're thinking. So to me, the exercise in empathy is what's going to save our urban, you know, hopefully going to move us past urban rural divides and get us interconnected. And also, I hope that it will move us forward uh, in this country uh, as a whole as we move forward, because we're pretty. We're pretty divided right now, and it's very heartbreaking. In any case, that was my editorial for the day, folks. Sorry about that. Uh, I am going to do the, the word of the week. I already gave a word of the week, empathy, and that's just walking in another's shoes. Uh, but the other word is oblique, angle, indirect. Did you know? To make an oblique reference to something is to mention it glancingly, leaving the listener unclear as to the nature or context of the thing referred to. The children's question relating to iPads was too oblique for the librarian to answer, but she showed them to the technology section of the library. So there we go with oblique. And then we're going to move to arts and culture activities in the county. Arts Council of Lake Oswego, ACLO's unveil your process exhibit, First Friday Reception. Exhibit features the 15 Gallery Without Walls artists. Artwork includes preparatory work, drawings, paintings, jewelry, glass, and other wonderful works of art. October 5th, 5 to 7, at 510 Museum and Art Space in Lake Oswego. And the Spiral Gallery's Four Seasons Exhibit. Oh, and this is out in Estacada. First Friday opening, join Phyllis Fuerly and Geraldine Walker for Spiral Gallery's First Friday. Fused glass and handcrafted jewelry will be featured in the gallery. The show will be in the gallery for the month of October, and refreshments will be served October 5th, 6 to 8 p.m. at the Spiral Gallery in Estacada. And remember, Pippin is uh, playing at the Lakewood Center for the Arts. And I know that Clackmas Repertory Theater just had a successful uh, season. They just finished up at the end of September with the play Ripcord, and they are beginning to set their season for the next year. So we have two great theater companies, and I know Sonia will mention what Kirk is up to uh, as a theater uh, director in the arts, um, but we have a lot of, a lot of fun stuff to do in this county. I encourage people to take advantage of it. Hand off to you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner okay. Fisher. Thank you. I really... Um, Commissioner Schrader, what you've talked about really resonates when you talk about divides because we have urban-rural divides that we are um, grappling with here in Clackamas County. We also are divided in this nation. Um, today is a day when the um, we're dealing with the Kavanaugh nomination at, at our, in our Senate, and there is a very distinct divide in our country. But what I'm thankful for here is that we here at the local level, and we have a wonderful commission here that, that works so well together, that we have the opportunity because of our commitment, our values, and our relationships with each other and with our constituents to really move the dial on issues that are very, very important. I've been spending quite a bit of time advocating for the Metro Housing Bond. The reason why I am so committed to this effort is because we have an opportunity with our commission being as we are so aligned with our interest in helping to move the dial on providing more affordable housing. At the local level, if this bond passes, Clackamas County will have $116 million that we will be able to invest in housing affordability. 
if the constitutional amendment passes, that means that we will be able to leverage those bonding dollars in public-private partnership so that we can really implement the things that we value here in Clackamas County, which is mixed income housing. We are not advocates of putting all people that are economically challenged off in what's called affordable housing. We want to create opportunities and create a foundation that will help to um, our young people to have a place to call a first home and our seniors to have a place where they can downsize if they so choose. So I've enjoyed, um, I've been on the phone, I've been calling people, urging their support, I've been talking to donors and asking them to contribute. I'm happy to say that my fellow commissioners will be joining in this effort to promote this bond. And I'm confident that with the commitment that we have, and especially with Commissioner Savas asking all of the deep questions that are the important questions regarding how this will all be implemented, that we will be able to um, do good with these dollars if the voters so agree that this is a very important issue for us today. So with that and with talking about uh, people in need, I wanted to also mention that our Early Learning Hub is making a splash with, um, with free rain boots. So what we have, we will launch, launch a Make a Splash Children's Free Rain Boot Program this month. And this program will qualify for um, income challenge families, the Oki Rain Boots for children ages six and younger. So um, I really encourage folks to reach out, to, um, to call us at 503-650-5682. And I think the numbers are on there, hopefully. Yes, they are, to, um, to get your free rain boots. Uh, I know when I was a little kid, my mom used to say to me when it was raining outside, oh, good, it's raining, get your boots. So as a native Oregonian, I don't cringe and complain when it rains. I get a little excited for the rain. So hopefully with these rain boots, we can encourage that, and all kids should have rain boots. So there we go. Thank you. Commissioner Savas. Well, <clears throat> things... Uh, the way things are shaping up today, um, appreciate again staff putting together that video. Didn't know about that um, till uh, till just a little bit ago, and then um, Les's comments, his earlier comments regarding an article I think he pulled from ten years ago. Maybe think back of how and why I'm here, um, why I really ran for this position, which I didn't really plan on talking about that, but it all relates to where we are today about housing and and the people that are. Uh, finding themselves homeless or are homeless or on the edge of being homeless and uh, this housing crisis that we have before us and I uh, the article um, in essence or in that period of time 12 13 years ago uh, was the awareness we all had in the region all elected officials all jurisdictions that we were headed down this this path and uh, my call then was all right so what are we going to do about to uh, uh, to either remedy or to adjust or to compensate so that we, we don't, um, we can minimize those impacts. And um, so that, that voice went unheard for a long time. And um, when I first came on the commission, I do remember distinctly uh, having that conversation with some of my colleagues at the time. And, um, you know, I remember former Commissioner Laniger and I spending a Sunday out driving around in the community showing her where I thought we would have some severe impacts. And, um, um, and I appreciate that the fact that she joined me, but it uh, just brings me back to a period in time where we really, really haven't made as much progress. So I think the government ourselves should be part of the solution as much as we can and not and do what we can to not, not be part of the problem, not do harm. Um, and I think there's a pretty principle, let's do no harm. Um, and so I'm hoping to, um, to do what I can to educate other elected leaders in the area on things that we can do to not be part of the problem and be part of the solution. Um, we're working on many aspects that I do appreciate. Uh, I don't know who's all joining us this afternoon, but at three o'clock today, we'll be looking at one form of housing, which is manufactured housing. Um, and uh, I know that sometimes uh, I'm called out as a guy that gets in the details, but I think that's what you kind of elect us to do. Um, someone's got to do it. And I'll make a point here. Um, 
the type of housing we're looking at, if we would try to implement that, even at a higher estimate cost, we could actually double the amount of housing with that $116 million we would conceivably get from that housing bond. Uh, we'd actually double the amount of housing if we actually chose to use it as efficiently as possible. And not that, we, not that everyone wants to choose to live in that kind of housing. Some people maybe want to live in something smaller or maybe in multifamily housing, uh, mixed income housing, single family home. Um, you know, people want to have the choice. Some people have to live in subsidized housing. Others will choose for their own reasons, pride, dignity, not to, not to live in subsidized housing, to be on their own, to be independent. We passed an ADU ordinance to allow for more housing. We'll make some refinements on that to do even better. But I think it's about choice. But government can't solve this on its own. Um, it's going to take the private sector, I think, uh, substantially to, to build the housing. We can accommodate that by reducing some of those barriers as reasonably as possible in order for them to do that. Uh, we can stop and prevent what we can um, in the ways of gentrifying and uh, displacing people by building areas or contributing areas being built and developments being built that actually cause the, those values, those, those land values to go exceedingly high and push people out of their own homes and neighborhoods, which is going on in the area that I live in. So I, I think it's really, as we call it, the spectrum or the, the continuum of housing is really about the, the place and time from being homeless all the way to being where you want to be. That's the continuum. The spectrum of housing is more along the lines of the type of housing where people want to live, whether that's geographically or the structure or whatnot. And um, I chose to, and again, I didn't know that staff would do this, but I chose to actually take the definition um, of a shelter. Here's what the definition of a shelter is. A place giving temporary protection from bad weather or danger. And uh, so we have, fortunately, we have, our goal last year was to make sure that this, this shelter would be in place before the weather came, um, ideally two years ago, but it happened. And we're doing that, and the weather's coming, that's great. Um, but we have to realize that that's not where we want to house people. That's just a means of getting them to a better place. And it's a transition, and that's the key, that's the key message um, here today. Um, and I'm looking forward to hoping that all of us can at least go this afternoon and, um, and go tour one of these ha housing sites um, I also want to take a look at some ADUs. We ought to take a look at some of those. Uh, Martha and I have been to a conference where they had some tiny homes. They had someone displayed there. We need to look at all alternatives and see how we can get the biggest bang for the buck should this bond measure be successful. Um, and with that, I'll stop. Great. Thank you. Uh, I just want to note that Tammy Little is still in the audience here. Uh, she's our... Uh, um, <laughs> Tax assessor. Tax assessor and is running for this office, and I want you to know that I totally support you. Uh, Bob thought of you as the right person to take his place, and I agree. And because we have the ability as elected officials to sit up here and say exactly that, um, I wish you the best of luck, and where do I get a sign? Yes. Uh, and I would like a sign also. You've been doing a great job. You haven't. It has not been easy. Uh, and as far as the rain boots, I just came back from New Orleans where wish I was at a conference. Where you wish you'd had some. Wish I wish I had had some. <laughs> at one point, there was a rainstorm that was so bad that I almost missed my plane waiting for it to go. I finally had to go in ankle-deep water uh, to, to get to my uh, hotel to get my luggage. Uh, and uh, even got so wet, the security uh, x-ray machine, uh, they had to search me because I was so wet <laughs> that it picked it up on the, uh, on the uh, uh, security screen. And the guy, I said, you got anything in your pocket? I had this tiny piece of paper. And then he touched me and said, oh, I, I get it. Uh, but there's one thing I really learned. Uh, which isn't news to me, actually, is that, uh, first off, the federal government is not going to come along and help us resolve our wastewater treatment problems, which a lot of that is I and I. That's water getting into our system in the rain. Uh, and uh, consolidation of uh, wastewater and drinking water is the key to the success 
and to uh, you know lowering the costs of uh, big projects. Uh, we uh, formed a 190, uh, which is a consolidation of uh, a couple of facilities, and um, combined we're able to do a uh, build a new digester. Uh, which will give us the ability to fix one when it goes down. Uh, all over the country, they are doing this. We, one of the speakers was from the federal government. Uh, he didn't have a lot of, um, I would say, uh, he wasn't going to come and save anybody. <laughs> uh, everybody's looking at consolidation. And that is what we need to do in the future. We need to address problems like Gladstone or Westland from uh, I and I, and we need to do that together. Because if we can stop that, we can reduce the co what we have to spend in the future. And uh, it's key that we work together to resolve these problems. Um, I think that. Oak Grove Jennings Lodge, uh, they combined a water and sewer uh, wastewater treatment uh, under one umbrella, which reduced double staffing, uh, double administration, and I think that's that was a really great move. And uh, Clackamas County's done the same thing with wastewater. Uh, consolidating water, however, is a uh, um, is something that the water providers will have to do. We do not provide water. Um, there are many of them, Sunrise Water District, and I know Ken wants to say a little bit about that. That That is something they're doing all over the country too. And many of them, counties do provide water. Um, but um, it's it's uh, it was a very interesting conference. I told Don that I used my procurement card and bought a $30 million wastewater treatment plant, uh, jokingly. Uh, but they had about a mile worth of uh, vendors there, and of course I didn't know anything, and everyone wanted to talk to me. Uh, but um, it's amazing what they do. And sometimes, uh, uh, as far as procurement, um, it's not always the lowest bid, but it's the, the uh, product that will provide you the best longest lasting service and that's something that we do look at um, so it was a, a interesting conference um, New Orleans is is uh, you know below the floodplain uh, to say and, the least <laughs> to say the least um, and uh, when it when it started raining the uh, uh, sewer covers were jumping off the ground oh my god you know, rattling like crazy when I was crossing the street. Uh, and I was just worried that thing was going to shoot off of there. But uh, <clears throat> it, it, I'm sure they have lots of pump stations that, that they work on. Um, I also appreciated the knowledge that Greg Geist, uh, he was, we uh, received an award at, I think, a Utility of the Future Award uh, for our outreach to the community to communicate. You know, there's one of the other big problems is finding workers in the in that field. You know, it's uh, it's like in the automotive field. It used to be a dirty, nasty job that you got all greasy. This is high tech these days. Uh, it's not the same job. It's a great career. And getting youth involved, that's, uh, you know, looking at that as a potential career is something that everybody's doing all over the country. Uh, and uh, we uh, we got the award because of our outreach to the community uh, to tell them, you know, when you flush the toilet, you don't even think about what happens after that, uh, unless, of course, you're on a septic system. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it's amazing. A few years, when I was a kid, the Willamette River was awful. It was just awful before the sewer, system, uh, uh, sewer treatment plants were, uh, well, they were in the 70s is when a lot of them, um, <clears throat> I think in the 50s was when the government spent the money on them. In the 70s, there was a consolidation effort, and um, 
but the Willamette River, and we had rivers in this country that actually caught fire. Uh, so we've come a the long Ky way. Yep, in the, the Cuyahoga River. In, in, yeah? Yep. And we've come a long way. Uh, we still got a long way to go, but uh, uh, micro filters and other things that they're doing, uh, pretty amazing stuff. Um, ultraviolet treatment, um, oxygenation, uh, uh, you know, uh, I one time went to a sewage treatment plant up in outside of Seattle where they have weddings. Uh, you know, the water comes out into a waterfall and, and it, they had weddings at this sewage treatment plant. You wouldn't even know there was a sewage treatment plant. And uh, I would think we're a ways from doing that, but... Uh, <laughs> I'm, but uh, we've come a long way, and technology has come a long way. And I think one thing that actually back to what Les said, you know, a lot of the uh, manufacturing jobs are going away because of technology, uh, you know, robots and things like that. Uh, but um, we have to figure out as a country, as a world, how we're going to adapt to that. And that's going to be a challenge. That'll be a, a, a long conversation. But... We probably don't have that long to talk. So, Ken? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I realize we don't normally go back, but I wanted to touch basis with the, the 190 agreement concept that you were talking about. When I served on the Clackamas River Water Board, we formed a 190 agreement, which is a partnership, basically, with Sunrise Water Authority. As a result, we've saved the, the ratepayers in those two districts hundreds of thousands of dollars by being able to combine efforts of purchasing, and, among other things. Just want to leave this thought with the people in, in the community to think about. There's approximately 26 water boards alone, water districts alone, in this region. That means you have 26 boards who receive compensation of one kind or another, 26 chief executive officers, all of whom make well over $100,000 a year, 26 chief financial officers who make very good salaries, 26 chief engineers as well as 26 separate and different billing systems. That is not efficient. It's that simple. So we really do need to look at how do we combine these, these agencies together into single agencies uh, that provide the most efficient and cleanest water that we can to our public. Just want to leave that thought with people to think about, do we really want to continue this system that's so expensive when there are opportunities to make it less expensive. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, anything else to add? We're good to the order? Up with that, we'll adjourn. Thank you very much.